Mm. OK, um, welcome everybody to uh, this talk by the uh, Loughborough University Nationalism Network. Uh, today is a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Thomas um, Hillan Eriksson. Um, Thomas is an anthropologist, he's based at the University of Oslo. And he has extensively written on nationalism, uh, but not only on nations and nationalism. He is a very prolific author uh, uh, with a, a variety of research interests in uh, particularly ethnicity, cultural, culture, uh, globalization. Uh, I would say that recently for me was a bit of a surprise, but you can let us know why you also moved to the climate uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it is interesting to see how you can address uh, this intersection between nations, nationalism and uh, uh, the climate change, uh, which there are very few authors at the moment they are writing about. So we're particularly uh, curious to see what is uh, the take that Thomas has on this topic. Uh, Thomas was, uh, is also a member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and between 2015 and 2016, he was the president of the European Association of Social, Social Anthropologists. Besides being a scholar, he's also a writer, something that I'm not familiar with, but I'm curious to see what <laughs> the topic is all about. But um, without uh, taking too much time. Uh, I'm conscious that uh, usually we keep uh, within an hour, but uh, for the people in the room, we might take maybe a bit more more of the time if there are extra questions. Uh, Thomas uh, um, will talk for about um, uh, 40 minutes, and then as usual, we will have time for Q&A. So uh, I'm going to close uh, my own camera, close my own microphone. May I please invite everybody in the room to keep the camera and the microphone closed. And when the Q&A uh, starts, uh, you can obviously open the camera if you want and obviously the microphone. Otherwise, we were not able to uh, hear your question. I would prefer if you can ask the questions by opening the microphone instead of putting the chat, it would be easier for me to uh, manage all the Q&A. Thank you very much. And the floor is for Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, first of all, thank you to Marco for, for this uh, wonderful invitation. Uh, I'm really very pleased. Never been to Loughborough and alas, it wasn't to be this time either, but maybe on a later occasion I'll be able to, to show up physically. Now the topic of my talk, nationalism and climate change. Why nationalism and climate change? Um, it, it's a way for me to try to combine two of the big issues of the day, two of the big topics of the day about which I feel passionately and which are incredibly important and about which there isn't much of a literature really. I mean, uh, we have a huge literature on climate change, also from the humanities and social sciences. We have a growing scholarly and non-scholarly literature on nationalism, but very few scholars have so far looked at them uh, through the same lens. And this is what I'm going to try and do during uh, this talk. And let me start with a small anecdote, because my first fieldwork as an anthropologist was in the multi-ethnic island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. And a very famous Mauritian author, well, he's famous in Mauritius, called Malcolm de Chazal. He writes in one of his novels from the 1950s, A l'île Maurice, on cultive la canne à sucre et les préjugés. In Mauritius, we grow sugarcane and prejudices. And it took me 20 years to realize that all of my engagement in Mauritius for 20 years had focused on the second part of that sentence on the prejudices, on the ways in which people try to negotiate the relationship between the ethnic communal identities on the one hand and an overarching Mauritian identity on the other. Whereas at the same time, I mean, the, that island had been subject to massive environmental transformation since the beginning of colonialism in the early 18th century. Half of the island was cultivated with sugarcane. 52% was cultivated with sugarcane. It's a bit less now because of infrastructural developments, but it's still massive. And it completely transformed not only the ecology, but also the lives of the people who arrived there. So I'm trying to make amends and also in other fields. So in the last few years, I've uh, written and done quite a bit of research 
on climate change, on biodiversity and on environmental destruction. Trying in this talk and in some of my other recent writings, some of which are in press, uh, to, uh, uh, to see these uh, through the same lens. Because it is true that uh, climate change is conspicuously absent from the theory of nationalism. No matter where you look, if you look at one of the canonical writers in the theory of nationalism, if you start with Ernest Gellner, 1983, Nations and Nationalism, it's about industrial society. Or you take Benedict Anderson, also 1983, Imagined Communities. Uh, he writes about the significance of print capitalism in enabling people to develop an abstract sense of community. Or you could take uh, you know, Eric Hobsbawm, John Bray, A.D. Smith, any of the uh, great writers on nationalism from the late 20th century. They do not really deal with the environment or climate at all. If they can be excused because climate came onto the agenda towards the end of the last century, but it has arrived on the agenda with uh, vengeance. So, um, According to Eric Hobsbawm, I mean, he was one of the few writers at the uh, at the time who argued that uh, nationalism is probably going to wane. It's going to get, it's going away because it's not compatible. The, the the ideology of the nation state is not compatible with the globalization of capitalism. So there's a contradiction here between globalized capital and the uh, territorial and political limitations of the nation state. I am going to argue that if nationalism does wane if it does go away i'm not sure if it will okay it has shown itself to be very resilient but if it does it may be because of the cumulative effects of what i speak of as treadmill com uh, contradictions destructive treadmill contradictions to which i'm going to return in a little while <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> so there is a job to be done here but i should say at the outset that it's not just me there are a few other people uh, there is a sociologist called Daniele Conversi, who works in Bilbao, but he lives in Rome, who writes quite extensively uh, in various journals about uh, climate and uh, nationalism. And uh, another anthropologist called Lorenzo Pusocco, also in Italian, who works in Rome, uh, uh, does the same thing. And I might be able to think of maybe a small handful of others who see the significance of connecting um, the great challenge facing humanity, Anthropocene effects, um, with uh, what is still the most powerful ideology of inclusion and exclusion, the ideology of the, of the modern state, namely nationalism. So let's get on with it. Let's get the work done and, uh, and see what we have to, if we have anything interesting to say about this relationship, which I think we should. If we take the history of uh, nationalism, and we could start with uh, with a the Gellnerian theory. Now, this is a this is a coal mine. So you can see it's an open pit coal mine in Australia, where I did fieldwork some years ago called Calite in Queensland. So if we take um, uh, nationalism and industrial society, which is a starting point for Gellner, to him nationalism is in a way a functional product of industrial society, enabling complex state organization and enabling a sense of belonging and identity to people who would otherwise have been uprooted and alienated, to put it simply. Historically, there's an almost exact fit between the era of nationalism and the era of fossil fuels. Starting at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, a massive exploitation of fossil fuels began and nationalism, certainly in Europe, but also in North America and later elsewhere in the world also started to uh, to become um, uh, salient and uh, politically important. Uh, and it uh, continued to be so, as did the economy of fossil fuels. So one obvious question that we may keep at the back of our minds for now is, if we're going to divest from fossil fuels, if we're going to move on to a more sustainable track, a different modernity, or even a, some kind of post-modernity, um, will nationalism be able to cope with that? And will nationalism be able to resolve some of the contradictions that arise from our dependence on fossil fuels? Um, I'm coming to this 
but first, uh, the, the second big theory that was also very inspirational for me as a student and later, many of you would have seen this painting. Lots of people think that this painting is called Rembrandt's mother. It's not. It's a myth, okay? It's not Rembrandt's mother. It's a, a painting by the Dutch or Flemish uh, painter Gerard Doe, 1631, and it's called something like Lesene Oude Frau, Reading Old Woman. So it's not Rembrandt's mother, but it's a reading old woman who is poring over a book after uh, the event of, uh, of Gutenberg and the printing press, when books became affordable, not to everyone, but to a fairly large proportion of the uh, bourgeois populations in, in Europe and elsewhere. And it spread really rapidly, I mean, the printing press, enormously rapidly. So it was clearly a needed, um, a needed technology. So the, uh, the theory of the abstract or imagined communities, um, they contribute to identification beyond that which is immediately perceivable, making it possible for us to identify with people whom we will never meet. So here there is a potential resource when we begin to think about climate change, which obviously cannot be dealt with effectively on a local basis. I mean, yes, it can, certainly, up to a point, but beyond that point, uh, you need an imagined community of like-minded, committed people, institutions, and so on, who, uh, uh, who are determined to, um, to deal with the problem. In this century, it's almost inevitable that we in include Anthropocene effects in one way or another in major research projects. I mean, just as in the uh, 1970s, 80s, 80s when I was a student, you needed to have a gender perspective if you wanted research money. Okay, and uh, today, um, if you have something to do with uh, environmental uh, issues or with climate in your research application, your chance of getting funding is probably slightly better or maybe much better than if you did not, simply because it's all around us now. And uh, we know that it's going to shape our future and it is already in many parts of the world shaping our present. So uh, this um, diagram, many of you would be familiar with one version of it on planetary boundaries. You can see that in some areas uh, we're doing okay for now but we will not be doing okay much longer. Uh, we get these alarming reports regularly through the press about uh, the way in which uh, we are rapidly getting rid of wild animals. What's happening here? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Getting rid of wild animals, getting rid of wetlands. They're being drained for the sake of agriculture. We're chopping down forests in order to produce beef to feed people who want the, the Saturday evening steak. And there are more of them than ever before who can afford the steak. And, uh, you know, if you take flights, only between 2004 and 2019, the number of plane tickets in the world more than doubled, okay, in 15 years. More than doubled from 2 billion to nearly 4.5 billion. When I first saw that figure, I thought, there must be something wrong here. I have to check it. And I checked, double-checked and triple-checked, and it's true. Uh, from 2 billion to 4.5 billion in just 15 years. Notice 2019, okay, the pre-pandemic year. In 2020, the picture was quite different. So, um, looking at the unintentional consequences of modernity and of industrial fossil fuel uh, uh, modernity uh, is almost inevitable if we want to understand the world today. It's not the only piece in the jigsaw puzzle, but it's an imp increasingly important one. And uh, I'm going to argue, and some of you may disagree, which is fine, uh, that there is a fundamental contradiction between economic growth and ecological sustainability. It's very hard to imagine as a, an economic system where you can have both. Sustainability defined here as a system capable of reproducing itself indefinitely without undermining its own conditions. And what we're doing now is we are undermining our own conditions, aren't we? Uh, the very causes of the pleasant, comfortable, uh, global middle and upper class lives that you and I lead now, the very causes for that 
are the same causes as the one, ones which are undermining uh, conditions for uh, continuing this way of life in a not so distant future. So this is this is what I mean, one way in, in which one could speak of the significance, the importance of looking at climate change in connection with uh, the great sort of unifying and divisive ideology of the day, namely nationalism. Um, and um, this image, which is also familiar to you, the Uruboros, uh, is a snake which is eating itself through its tail, right? Initially, well, it has, it has appeared in many cultures through history, but it is believed that initially it was an Egyptian symbol. It was an Egy Egyptian symbol of fertility and rebirth. And now it, it can be reinterpreted as something far more sinister. We have a civilization which is eating itself by its tail. What used to be our salvation for 200 years, the fossil fuel economy, has suddenly turned into our damnation. And it's very hard for us to get our heads around this. It's counterintuitive, it's difficult, and it, uh, understanding it requires some intellectual imagination and an openness to um, redrawing the map because the territory has changed. Okay, um, now, treadmill competition is another concept that I'm working with. And uh, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a paper out there on, on the treadmill, on the on treadmill competition, uh, which can easily be downloaded if anybody's interested from the Max Planck Institute in, in Halle, Germany, uh, on, uh, on the treadmill competition and, uh, and, um, and ecology and capitalism. Uh, so the treadmill competition, it's, you know, it, uh, it is also sometimes dubbed not least in evolutionary biology, the red queen paradox or the red queen phenomenon. This image, some of you would recognize it, is from um, Alice in Wonderland. Well, not Alice in Wonderland, but the second book about Alice, the one called Through the Looking Glass. Through the Looking Glass. And Alice is being held by the hand, she is being held captive, basically, by the red queen. And the red queen orders her to run as fast as she can. And Alice runs as fast as she can, but she doesn't move an inch. And, she, and then in the end, she says, Your Majesty, there's something wrong here. Because where I live, in my world, when you run, you actually move from one place to another. And the uh, queen shakes her head and says, that's not the case here. Here you have to run as fast as you can in order to stay in the same place. And this is one of the paradoxes of competition, isn't it? Um, in order to keep your place in a competitive system, for example, a system of political power, military might, or economic clout between nation states, you have to run as fast as you can. You cannot fall asleep. Same applies in nature, same applies to the spruce trees growing just outside the city where I live. They have to stretch as fast as, as high as they can in order to outcompete the others so that they get enough sunlight to uh, produce uh, new offspring, and you can see it in uh, in product development. You know, um, competition between various uh, companies producing, for example, smartphones. Okay, yes, the smartphone. If Samsung does something, then Apple has to follow suit, and and so on and so forth. But in a sense, treadmill competition can also lead to people or groups or nations or corporations standing still at an enormous speed. You're not really getting anywhere. You're like Alice. You run as fast as you can and you're staying in the same place. Um, you may not contribute to the world becoming a better place. And instead, you may contribute to uh, massive environmental destruction. So competition between nation states is, is clearly... Um, not good news if we look at the potential for nationalism to deal with climate change. There are few alliances around climate change. There are some. There are many international treaties that have been signed by lots of countries, but they haven't had that much effect, have they? The scientific knowledge about climate has been around for 30 years, and still we see healthy growth, or healthy, unhealthy growth, uh, in the realms of um, 
coal production, coal mining, coal exports, consumption, uh, oil and gas. And of course, the country where I live is one of the one of the villains, one of the culprits here, uh, trying very hard to speak with two tongues and not always succeeding, being sustainable and yet committed to exploration of new oil fields. It's it's very, it's very interesting uh, to watch as a rhetorical maneuver by by uh, politicians. And the argument is very often that if we're going to keep up with the others, keep up with the Saudis, keep up with everybody else, we've got to continue. You know, we cannot be left behind. So treadmill competition is uh, can be a recipe for some of these large scale cumulative unintentional consequences, which are not really being perceived until they become very palpable, very perceptible and become part of everyday life, simply because there is no instance um, which has a full overview of the world and of the situation and that can tell us, look, we've been heating up enough now. It's overheated. The world is overheated. We need to cool down. There is no instance that has the power to um, tell us that this is what we need to do. Instead, we have a uh, um, treadmill competition between nation states as a predominant form in the in the global economy and between corporations. So um, at the same time, uh, we can see that there are some some uh, signs on the horizon which are not exactly positive if one is interested in global uh, cooperation or, or multilateral cooperation. The United Nations has been weakened uh, dramatically in the last few decades. Um, so multilateral, multilateralism in general has been weakened. And we can also see in many countries around the world, uh, and I don't even want to begin to list those countries, tendencies of nationalist withdrawal. So uh, let's think about some possible scenarios uh, given this background. Nationalism remains strong. It has some counterproductive effects because it uh, uh, encourages treadmill competition between nation states and uh, the mounting challenges of uh, environmental destruction and climate change uh, require collective action beyond uh, the scale of the nation state. This, I mean, all of this is trivially true, but let's see where we can take it. So, um, yeah, let's, let's return to this. In Gellner's magisterial and still very influential book from 1983, uh, he wrote about the transition mainly from agraria to industria. Gellner, in his own words, was a big ditch theorist. He liked big ditches. He liked those device, dividing lines between epochs or eras in history. And he was um, a materialist. So he looked at technological change. So you have those classic big ditches, you know, the state, agriculture, um, and uh, the city, and uh, writing, and eventually from the mid to late 18th century in Britain, somewhat later elsewhere, the transition from agrarian society to industrial society, fueled by coal. Um, question is, what are we now transitioning to? What is coming after industrial? Some of my colleagues, who are also scholars of nationalism, suggest that we're moving towards Siberia. Not Siberia in, in Russia, okay, but Siberia, C-Y, Beria, Siberia. So agraria to industria, industria to Siberia, cyber, a cyber society. That may be part of the story, but that's not part of the story I want to focus on, because it's not going to ruin our, well, it may ruin our lives, but it may, it's not going to ruin the planet, at least not for now. So could it be a transition from industry to the Anthropocene, where we have to think of ourselves in the long term and as ecological creatures and not just as uh, human beings who are entitled to do as they like with their surroundings? Um, not a new idea, but still a very radical one. We, are, we do not have that kind of entitlement. We need to collaborate, and we need to collaborate with other humans living in completely different places in order to make sense of and affect the changes that we want. So that uh, uh, we, have to, we have to see those connections, the connections that 
that can be described in so many ways. One way of describing it is that the it's the growth of the middle class in China that has to some extent led to um, the disappearance of the Amazon forest. It's not their fault. They're just like you and me. They're like the middle and upper classes in Western Europe, but they're more recent and therefore also more visible because uh, they want the beef. And in order to get the beef, you want to have cattle. And the cattle need places to graze. And the Amazon or Brazil is a great place to have cattle uh, as, as soon as you remove the trees. So um, we need to see those connections, realizing that uh, uh, the nation state is not an adequate, it's not a sufficient framework for dealing with them. Unless it is possible to arrive at international agreements uh, which are binding and which lead to results in the real world. When I say this to some of my colleagues who are a bit more cynical than me, they say, dream on. Uh, but I, I think we should, we need to dream and we need hope. Uh, here's an interesting book uh, that just came out, edited by Peter Skalnik, a Czech anthropologist on Ernest Gellner's legacy and social theory today. And in this book, there is in fact, a chapter by the aforementioned Daniele Conversi, <laughs> where, excuse me, where he tries to see Gellner's theory in the light of um, Anthropocene effects, as I call them, or, 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 or climate change. Um, I'm not going to spend any more time on that, just to, to, just to notify you that it's not just me. Okay, we are, we are a small group of people who have that commitment to looking at nationalism and climate change through the same lens. And what we may be seeing in a not too distant future is a reversal of the historical drift towards greater social complexity, which relied on technology and which relied on high levels of high energy use. I mean, the size of cities these days, for example, would have been unthinkable had there not been effective energy intensive modes of both production of food and of transportation. So that the, uh, you know, 30 odd million inhabitants of Tokyo or Yokohama would be able to, to, to get the food and their, um, and their supplies um, effectively. In, in, in the past, before the fossil fuel revolution, this kind of factor limited severely the size of cities the distance between the urban um, dwellers and the people who produced uh, food. So that's, that could be, you know, um, that, that could be a possibility. We have to keep these options open, uh, depending on how dramatic the effects of environmental destruction and climate change are, how desperate people get. In some parts of the world, they're already quite desperate. I mean, ask people in Western Pakistan how they feel about the the massive flooding they had last year. Not fun and not their fault, ours. Anyway, um, so a lesson from the pandemic or rather something that came out of the pandemic uh, at the time, 2020-2021, was a clear cooling down or deceleration in the physical world. Suddenly, the wheels started to move more slowly. Some were brought to a standstill. Airports were closed. Uh, you know, politicians told uh, their citizens that there's no point going out. I mean, for one thing, you get a fine. And for another, everything is closed. So there's nothing to do. Shops and restaurants are closed. Uh, you cannot travel. Stay at home. Don't go to work because you might uh, infect others or you might be infected. So uh, do as little as you can. Quite the opposite of the gospel of neoliberalism that had been uh, uh, advertised for, for 40 years. So that was a fascinating time for, for social scientists. But at the same time, as we saw this deceleration in the physical world, at least for a couple of years, last at least for a couple of years, there was an acceleration in the digital world. So I reckon that uh, Netflix and HBO did rather well in the fiscal years of 2020, 2021, much better than airlines. It's, uh, it's quite obvious, isn't it? So a possible scenario, which also transcends some of the limitations of nationalism, it could be a networked, decentralized world of what I call sideways scaling. Sideways scaling, not scaling up, not scaling down, but scaling sideways through networks, uh, which this technology enables uh, and makes possible in ways which humanity have not seen before. 
So let's not worry too much about the smartphone. It has some liberating potentials as well when it comes to alternative ways of organizing society and alternative ways of organizing your identity. Right. So um, one question that someone was asked during the 1990s when the Internet suddenly came over us and uh, multi-channel TV became ubiquitous and so on was this. If Benedict Anderson was right in stating that print capitalism uh, enabled nationalism, what is uh, the Internet going to enable? Because it's a, it's a deterritorialized technology. Maybe something very different. Maybe something post-national or non-national, based on interests, based on something else. Um, so far, it hasn't happened, strangely enough. But uh, there's a resilience here. Uh, but it, uh, it is still a, a possibility that uh, uh, modes of ideology, identity and social organization will shift and, uh, and that the new uh, digital technology will, uh, will be useful in affecting or contributing to that shift. There is a great, there is a link. I've already said that, so I may not have to spend a lot of time saying it now, but there is a connection between capitalism and nationalism, which is very hard to um, to argue against. Uh, capitalism uh, and nationalism, uh, the uh, sort of the nation state based capitalism, which leads to uh, making countries more or less competitive, more or less credit worthy. And uh, you look over your shoulder, you know, nationalism is relational. You can't have one nation, you've got to have at least two. Just like gender, you can't have one gender. You've got to have at least two. Otherwise, you don't have gender and you don't have nations. So it's relational and it's contagious. Nationalism is relational and it's contagious. So um, uh, that's part of the explanation why it's spread. If they've got a nation, we've got to have one. And our nation is going to be much better. It's going to have deeper roots, better myths, better food. And it's going to be economically uh, much more powerful uh, than, uh, than those others. But we now know that growth capitalism, well, we believe, some of us, that it's very hard to imagine growth capitalism as being sustainable. When I say growth capitalism, it's a bit, you know, sort of uh, unnecessary. I could just have said capitalism because growth is part of the uh, very machinery of, of, of uh, capitalism. And uh, what could come in its stead? It's not going to be easy. Many climate activists seem to underestimate the difficulty, the level of difficulty in shifting track and in changing uh, ways of living. Degrowth in economics, which is a concept that most economists uh, really have very little time for. The idea that, in fact, we can, uh, we can reduce. We shouldn't grow more. We can reduce, certainly in the affluent parts of the world. And then we'll have to see what we're going to do in Niger and Botswana, which will have to be something different. But they're not part of the problem in the same way as you and I are, because uh, unless some of you are in Botswana or, or, or Niger, because uh, their carbon footprint is just above zero and ours is, uh, is huge. So maybe degrowth could be one way of um, beginning to address the issues. Hasn't had much of an impact so far, though, beyond certain academic environments and some left-wing environments. But let's uh, put it on the table. Possibly degrowth is going to become more fashionable as the effects of climate change and environmental destruction are making themselves more felt, and not just in remote places, but here. Which they were to some extent, I guess, in England last year with a drought. Couldn't believe my eyes. North of the Alps, severe drought. Germany, England, etc. Never seen anything like it before. Not in my lifetime, at least. So maybe a reduction in complexity that I alluded to in one of my earlier slides, a reduction in complexity is coming. And in a magisterial book called The Com Collapse of Complex Societies by the archaeologist Joseph Tainton, wonderful book. And it was a great source of inspiration when Jared Diamond wrote his book, Collapse, in 2005 which became a global bestseller. Tainter's book is not narrative in the same way. It's not a potential bestseller, but it's full of, it's chock full of knowledge and insight and analysis and descriptions. And it takes on a number of complex societies which did collapse, 
from the Maya, you know, to the Romans and also many lesser known complex societies. And he says, complex societies are recent in human history. If we take the long view of human history, a couple of hundred thousand years back, or if we just go back to the exodus from Africa, 60, 70,000 years back, it's still recent. Collapse, then it's not a fall to some primordial chaos, but a return to the normal human condition of lower complexity. It has its costs. Um, as, as you know perfectly well, as I do, uh, but uh, we shouldn't rule it out as a possibility. And this would, in, in case, if it does happen, maybe not in our lifetime, but maybe in my children's lifetime, they're born around the turn of the century, um, we will see a reversal of the upscaling, which has characterized the last couple of hundred years and the era of the nation state. Upscaling, increasing complexity, increasing social complexity. Um, that may be that may be envisioned. Either way, um, we should probably be prepared for some pretty comprehensive changes, or at least we should begin to think seriously about them and not just think about the next year or, or the next four or five years. Or maybe we should begin to think in our um, social science research about um, scenarios that will unfold in 100 years, in 200 years. There's a rather nice book, popular book of philosophy uh, called uh, The Good Ancestor, written by um, Roman Krznarik, who's a philosopher at Oxford, and uh, he raises the question, how are we going to behave? How should we behave in order to be considered good ancestors by our descendants? And his answer is that, well, we should think and act differently and more long term and more slowly. So there's a there's an important job to be done by the social sciences and humanities in making sense of this. We can do identity, which natural sciences can't. They can do the facts, they can do the hockey stick graphs, and they can tell us just how warm, how much warmer the oceans have become in the last couple of years. But there are many things they cannot say, such as why do people don't want to change? Why do they continue even though they should? Uh, and they know that they should change their way of life. What kind of rationalization is going on in the global middle and upper classes when they say, when asked that climate is one of the main political priorities, but then they act as though it was non-existent. So uh, we're, the kind of contributions we can make are crucial, important, and they can build on what we know about the relationship between the imagined community and communication technology and uh, nationalism more specifically and the growth and the advent of industrial society. It's not going to be the same. We can build on some of those insights. After all, as the uh, late great uh, sociologist Daniel Bell said, uh, he said this several times in many ways. The last quotation I found was from 1999, a preface to a new edition of his book on the coming of post-industrial society. And he says, the national state has become too small for the big problems of life and too big for the small problems. It's, a, it's, it's well taken, but then it can be just right for a number of things. It can be just right for a number of things, such as universities, health services, highways. But the big problems of life, which are to do with global inequality, with environmental destruction, with climate, too small. And too big to give you a sense of belonging, to give you an anchored sense of, uh, you know, uh, feeling at home. Uh, that's his view anyway. You may wonder where this, no you don't, where this image comes from. This is DALI. I don't know if you're familiar with DALI, the uh, AI, um, the AI app that enables you to uh, generate art. So I asked DALI, can you draw me, you know, uh, a, a painting depicting nationalism and climate change? Dali came up in a matter of seconds with four alternatives, and this is one of them. It's not fantastic. Uh, it's not Picasso, but it does the job for me. Okay, so um, I will be ending quite soon, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions, but I have a few more things to say. Because uh, uh, there are, as I, as I pointed out, there are several alternative ways of thinking about the near future. The nation state is not going away. 
nationalism cannot be uh, um, it cannot be conjured away. We know quite a bit about this by now, don't we? Uh, it's very, very powerful. It connects people to the state. It connects them to each other. It connects them to the sport heroes, uh, to uh, myriad little things. Michael Billig, who many of you know, uh, wrote a book which still is unsurpassed in this field called Banal Nationalism in the mid-1990s, where he says that, you know, the unwaved flag is one of the most potent symbols of the nation because it's embodied, it helps you take it for granted. It's not spectacular, but it uh, makes your entire body a member of the nation, along with millions of people whom you will never meet. And the power remains strong. So one uh, challenge consists in tweaking and adjusting and um, uh, reforming nationalism to move beyond destructive treadmill competition and towards truly global cooperation. Because it's necessary. We have to think globally and everybody will have to make sacrifices. And well, people like myself should begin because we're the affluent ones. We are the problem. Okay, and I'm not saying this because I'm Norwegian, but because I belong to a particular social class and the gender and, and so on. Um, one tension in the uh, climate movement and in the environmental movement more generally, which is quite interesting when we think about the relationship between modernity and nationalism, is a tension between eco-modernism, you know, more technology, more knowledge of the same kind that we already got is going to help us uh, deal with the situation. So we just need the right kind of technology. On the one hand, eco-modernism, as I call it, or post-growth, um, a change in worldview, a change in outlook, learning from indigenous peoples, perhaps, um, relating to nature, not as the other, but as the self. Nature is us, we are nature, and we have a moral responsibility and not only for exploiting it, because we've done that for a long time and some of the results are now, well, as I said, the in unintended consequences now seem to surpass the intended consequences. So we've reached a tipping point where we need to think otherwise. So we have to change our value system, our outlook, our way of life, etc., in a dramatic, radical, post-modern way. When I say post-modern, I mean non-Cartesian way. So these are the two um, main, um, I might say, main uh, ideological trends in the in the green movement, which have been attention probably since the beginning of the green movement. I mean, in the green part in Germany, which is very interesting in this case, when it comes to uh, nationalism and uh, and and climate, interesting uh, interesting for a case study. In the green party, there has been. And still is a tension between what you could roughly speak of as fundis and realos. You know, the realos are open to compromising with others. They can govern with social democrats or others, and they can, you know, um, uh, accept that not everything is going their way as long as they can have some of their issues uh, carried through. Whereas the fundis want to keep the path clean and uh, not, you know, uh, compromise because... Uh, Compromise to them is a slippery slope and it will lead to uh, much less desirable results in the long term. So um, this is one way of beginning to think about uh, the green climate and national politics. And another way, which is just as important, I said, is about uh, being able to think beyond the imagined community of Anderson towards a much larger imagined community, uh, which is Probably it consists of all humans, but also, ultimately, one could speak of living systems. A we, a we that uh, contains living systems. And uh, this uh, acquiring uh, this kind of um, perspective is not impossible. We have seen in the past how people have been able to, and not just in the case of nationalism, have been able to transcend the limitations of the village, of the kin group, uh, and uh, attach themselves to morally committing uh, communities which are much larger, 
I'm thinking, I mean, not least about the world religions. Think about that conversion to Christianity or Islam. Fairly, uh, fairly hairy stuff at the time to uh, to become a Christian and suddenly become a brother or sister to uh, Christians everywhere. Um, so uh, it can be done, um, but we need someone should start. So. Um, yeah, this is just a poster, a degrowth poster. This is not, I mean, I'm not advertising degrowth as such. I'm just pointing out that uh, this may be a way of thinking about the economy that will be more respectable uh, than it has been so far, simply by virtue of necessity. And then we may begin to think about the parts of the economy that can continue to grow, those which are not destructive, and make, make, make the sanctions here. So... Um, Slowing down an overheated world. Well, that's one slogan that I've picked up or that I've been using when I've spoken about accelerated change uh, in the context of my research project called overheating. Don't just do something. Sit there. The opposite of what we have been told for many years. Maybe that's the most sustainable thing to do. Don't just do something. Sit there. Think about it. it it's counterintuitive. It goes against the grain. And it's... Uh, somehow um, an affront to the ideology of modernity. And yet, um, maybe just sitting there is something that we might be become better at. What is sure, whatever your conclusion, whatever your view of the nation state, international cooperation, scaling sideways or scaling up uh, and climate change, there's a need to think creatively there's no reason why a map of the world shouldn't look like this. It's just convention that tells us otherwise. And typically, uh, it was in South Africa that I went to workshops and seminars where this, or a version of this map of the world would you know, be used or would show up in many cases. Because here, suddenly South Africa is at the center of the world and Northern Europe is in the periphery. There's no reason why it shouldn't look like this. So we need to think outside of the box. We need to use our intellectual imagination and to think creatively in order to transcend some of the limitations that we've imposed on ourselves. But that does not mean that we should forget the insights that were given to us by our immediate ancestors. And in this case, for me, many of those immediate ancestors are the theorists of modernity and not least the theorists of nationalism, who are also theorists of modernity. So... So here we are. Um, you may or may not think that this is uh, paramount and urgent and uh, significant. I belong to that category of people who think that it is and that we need, really need to, uh, and that we should be careful about uh, how we focus our research and what we look at and how we're looking at it in order to find ways not of getting rid of the nation state or nationalism, it's not going to happen, or certainly not going to happen if some scholars say that it's, it's evil and it shouldn't exist. It's not going to happen. But ways in which we can use the energy, the power that has been released by, um, uh, by, by these ideologies in order to uh, move beyond treadmill competition towards cooperation. On that note, I end. I see that I've spoken for about well, a little more than 40 minutes and I was about the plan. So... Uh, so, Marco, uh, over to you, please, and, and questions, if there are any. Hey, thanks, Thomas. Um, I do have some questions, but I see already that we have questions in the chat. Um, sorry, it's not in the chat. Alex, please go ahead with your own question. Thank you. I hope you can hear me fine. Uh, yeah, that yes. was really, really great, really interesting. Uh, genuinely sympathetic, despite what I'm about to say, to, to everything you said, including the, the sentiment. And I'm sorry if I missed any of this. I was rudely interrupted by a phone call in the middle. I'm not a nationalism scholar, um, but I'm interested in how we can try and project how identities will interact into a world with two to three degrees warming, which I think is closer than we think. Um, global action is indeed needed. Um, but the global elite is increasingly distrusted. A local community action is also needed and increasingly happening and might accelerate. 
But so you get a picture of multiple layers of identity in addition to the role of national identity, where you can at one level, at one level see an increasing risk of friction and division across all those divides fueled by scarcity and conflict. So that's me kind of agreeing with you and, 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 and seeing the multi-layer thing. But on the one hand, what scares me about nationalism project um, it, it, sorry, what what scares me about uh, what scares me is what scares me about nationalism projected onto these other layers too. What scares me about nationalism is, uh, is I worry might happen at multiple layers too. But crucially, this is where I'm getting to my question. Sorry, it's a bit rambling. Um, states control most weapons. They control legitimate violence. Mm -hmm. They control military industrial policy. And what flows there is what threatens neighbors more quickly, what leaves wounds more quickly than climate change, what accelerates the forging of, uh, forging of identities. So I'm wondering what you make of the role of weapons, armies, the fact that nation states or states in general fueled by nationalism control, in, control is too strong a word, operate uh, the military industrial policy complex, as it were, and how you you imagine the role of organized violence in this unfolding horizon. Is this something we need to think about? Because it ends up bringing us back to the same problem. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit rambling. I'm just wondering about the role of that, but otherwise really sympathetic. Sorry for being a bit of more Not of a ramble. All. Thank you. Not at all. Thanks very much. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the uh, sort of uh, definitions of the state, isn't it? Well, at least one of the ways in which one has spoken about the state. You get it in Max Weber, you get it in Anthony Giddens, that there's a double monopoly of taxation and violence. You know, the only sort of le legitimate violence, as it were, comes from the state. But when you look at so-called failed states, uh, you get a different picture. I mean, what's happening in Sudan? Well, I mean, there is sort of one fraction there, which is, I guess, represents the state in one way or another. But it is, everything is a bit unclear. And uh, you have other examples of uh, countries where there's a lot of weapons around, a lot of violence, Eastern Congo uh, and also elsewhere, but where there is no state, as it were, that can regulate the use of violence. So, uh, um, you know, it may be that we have lots of misgivings about nationalism. It's exclusive. It excludes minorities. Uh, it's homogenizing. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not good for, for diversity and multiculturalism and so on. And it's not good for international cooperation and, uh, and climate. But on the other hand, what's the alternative? If the alternative is a non-state, um, that may be even less pleasant. So um, I don't know uh, what to say about this. Clearly, this is part of the, an important part of the power of, of, of nationalism, which has also been under theorized by the theorists I mentioned from the 1980s mostly, is uh, is the role of uh, of violence and uh, yeah. So um, I don't know what yeah. more to say about it. Yeah. I don't um, really have an answer. Thank you, Thomas. There is a comment in the chat. There are actually two questions in the chat. I'm not sure whether you can access the chat or. Maybe uh, I can read the I think comment. I can, just a moment, I'll see. Yeah, indigenous societies, that one? Yes, please. Yeah, all right, yeah, that's one by Eric. Um, yeah. Just a moment, indigenous societies are often seen as better guardians of nature biodiversity. This seems a rather romantic idea. Do you agree with this view? Well, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. You know, anthropologists have always instinctively defended indigenous people because it's been our bread and butter to uh, study small stateless societies and have instinctively defended them against uh, transgressions by, by the state and market. The, you know, the feeling is that they're being overrun and they're being uh, forced to join nation states without really having been asked. They're forced to be citizens and nobody asks them for their opinion. So that has been the instinctive view. I think we need a more complex view. And uh, you suggest, Eric, that there is some, there is a remnant of something romantic here, the noble savage in the, in the view of, uh, of indigenous peoples. And it's absolutely true. There are lots of differences, sorry, within indigenous groups. Many Australian Aborigines are perfectly good with that, in fact, positive and favorable to mining because it will give them jobs and it will take them out of poverty. Uh, and of domestic violence and alcoholism and the kind of social ills that have been plaguing Aboriginal communities for many years. So uh, many are pro-modernity pro, pro, pro modernity and others are not. But my short answer is that uh, 
when it comes to how to organize society, there isn't really much. There may be a little, but not that much we can learn from indigenous groups, because we live in complex societies with a very sophisticated division of labor. And uh, for the time being, um, we're not going to leave that behind. There's no will to do it. It's not realistic. And it would lead to unspeakable suffering if we were from one day to the next move from a, a society with a complex division of labor to one with, um, you know, which resembles as it were a small indigenous group. But that's the social organization when it comes to values and the way in which you relate to animals, to nature, to the ecology. There may be some timeless wisdom because it strikes me time and time again that uh, different indigenous groups have similar um, attitudes and similar ways of engaging with their surroundings. So in other words, modernity is the specialty here. Modernity is the unusual um, yeah, sort of way of uh, positing uh, a strict boundary between culture and nature. So Descartes and his uh, descendants have a lot to answer for. Whereas uh, you take indigenous groups in Siberia, I mean Siberia, S-I-B, okay? Not C-Y. In Siberia, indigenous groups in North America or in South America, and they would, in many cases, relate to their surroundings in comparable ways. Not as the other, with no clear boundaries, but as, as if we are part of a larger ecology. And uh, to my mind, this is also where we need to move uh, in our kind of society. Thomas, um, Alex put in the chat a bit of, um, yeah, some of the um, points he was making. Um, and uh, I would like maybe to pick up on the points that Alex has put in the chat, because basically, um, stressing how much nationalism, particularly the um, uh, the violence that is associated with the national states, uh, is a direct and indirect cause of climate change. So uh, when you talk about mm -hmm. climate change and the problems we are facing, and you associated these problems with nationalism, it seems to me that these problems are more associated with modernity per se. Mm -hmm. Now, nationalism, it's part of the story of modernity, but it's not the whole part of the story. So do you see any specifics that might be um, associated with nationalism when it comes to the problems of climate change here? Or again, is the bigger picture? Is mm -hmm. the ongoing competition among economies which certainly are um, nation-based, but in the age of globalization, not necessarily nation-based. So yes. what are the specifics here? Um, well, uh, I mean, probably, I mean, one of the, thanks very much, Marco. I mean, one of the clearest examples of a kind of treadmill, uh, a destructive form of treadmill competition would be armaments races. You know, they've got this many warheads, we need to have just as many of them, uh, preferably a few more, so that we can uh, be prepared should they attack us next week. So this, this kind of um, treadmill or spiral, it, it creates a world or it, it encourages a world based on, uh, on suspicion, not on trust. And uh, it goes without saying that war is bad news, you know, for the environment and for climate in general. Unfortunately, I'm not a dictator of the world, but I, I would like to point out that if, if we were to spend just 5% of the global military budget on fighting poverty, much of the poverty in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere would have been gone, just 5%. We spent a massive uh, amount of resources on, uh, uh, on weapons. I think Alexandra wants to come I in. I see Alex there, so it's coming on board. <laughs> I'm just nodding, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, well, so, yeah. So that's part of this part of the story. And how can we extricate ourselves from this? Um, I don't have the answer, but we should, should look at it. I mean, war, nationalism, and climate change. That would be that be a research project that I would certainly support. Yeah. Can, can I push you a bit on your reasoning, just maybe mm -hmm. a sort of clarification? Because on the one hand, you say that, yeah, the national state is here to stay, it's not going to go away. Um, and it's the time we need to be dreamer. And then you go back and then 
you try to find a way to go beyond Anderson imagining community and you mentioned that we can try to think about a larger imagined community. So I'm a bit confused in terms of how the things go, how this dynamic is happening. How do you see whether you see any more of a clarity or they can coexist so we can still have sort of small uh -huh. imagined communities organized around the nation and then a larger one. Are they coexisting? Is it one against the other? This always go down to obviously the debate about also cosmopolitanism versus yes. nationalism and people that obviously argue that you coexist and not. So where yeah. are your views on this? Well, um, clearly um, things don't look that promising at the moment regarding uh, a sort of more global cosmopolitan uh, outlook. But uh, I mean, in the 1990s, uh, there was a very strong and widely shared idea, not necessarily that we'd seen the end of history, which Francis Fukuyama uh, argued, but that uh, uh, globalization led to increased contact, increased trust, uh, and that it was on the whole a recipe for creating a sense of global uh, identity and global citizenship. Whereas uh, what we've seen in the present uh, century, and I think, you, you know, to me, the attack on the Twin Towers, 9-11, 2001, was, was, was a watershed. After this, we've increasingly lived in the world based on suspicion. And now, with the new technologies, uh, a world based on not only suspicions, but also rumors, fake news and lies. So... Um, yeah, I, 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 again, I don't have the answer, but we need to keep uh, the torch burning and remind ourselves and others that there are alternatives and things have been quite different in the past regarding how people identify. It's, it's, it's not, uh, uh, there's no automatic um, sort of relationship between uh, identity and, uh, and suspicion of others. Yeah. But, uh, okay. but, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I don't really, I don't have the, I, but you need institutions in place, uh, institutions which can wield real power and which have something to offer, which are not only going to tell you that you have to make sacrifices, but will can promise you that you will get a better life. It will be more peaceful. Uh, your grandchildren will grow up, you know, in a world where there are still songbirds and elephants. Um, uh, that might, I, I believe in that, you know, you should push sort of the button, which is not called bad conscience and fear, but the button, button which is called, uh, uh, you know, positive energy and uh, um, and hope. So, uh, but that's, that's a normative statement. And I'm not saying that this is happening empirically right now, but that it is an option and that we could, since you talk, spoke about scale, Marco, we can be quite flexible when it comes to the way we organize our lives. Most of our lives are really led on a very small scale, even if we live in huge societies. Even someone who lives in Tokyo, most of their life circles around the workplace and the family and, uh, and, and the uh, suburb or the part of Tokyo where they live. So uh, we, we lead most of our lives in, on a small scale. But then there are times when we need to uh, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. And uh, and this is where we can uh, learn from previous successes uh, regarding imagined communities, and not just nationalism, but other imagined communities as well. You know, Anderson himself, he was quite, he had a strong interest in various sort of left-wing uh, organizations, such as, I mean, or, or networks, anarchists, um, socialists, and so on, and, uh, and had a belief, it was tempered eventually, but ha had a belief that you can also have a strong identity based on that kind of thing, on the persuasion, not on ethnicity, not on place, but on ideas and visions. So that can also be, that can also be explored in, in research on nationalism and climate change. Thomas, there is also another comment, if you can access the chat, it's yes, again, Eric. Just a moment, yeah. Yeah, Kimlika, right, okay. Uh, Kimlika proposes to give domestic animals national citizenship rights and recognize wild animals as sovereign nations. Well, uh, right, then, yeah, Gary continues. But climate change, not, not more to power, power politics and the return of empire. Um, I didn't get, uh, there's some, there are some words missing there, I think, in the last sentence. Yes. Climate change. Yeah. Yes, I, I think, uh, yeah, the, Eric, I think maybe can clarify because something is missing in there, but I think it's, it's about 
again, oh, Eric, yes, if you can open the microphone, yeah, it would be easier. Sorry. Yes, I think if people can open the microphone, <laughs> it might be easier and shorter. Thank you. Yeah, so Susie um, as well. Thank you. If, you. if you want, you can open the microphone later. Go, yeah. Eric. So thanks for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so so I was wondering that that well, a, a climate activist or an animal right activist like Will Kimblicka and, and, and others, they, they, they seem to stick to the nation state. So he proposes to, to integrate nature into the, the international, the existing international order. And, and, yeah. and so I'm a bit, and, and it seems that, that you maybe also for lack of something better or something realistic on the horizon uh, seem to stick to the nation state as well. And But I'm afraid that, that maybe the conflicts that will surge from climate change will, will more probably um, lead more to uh, a return of empire and, yes. and the right of the strongest. And, uh -huh. and so... Um, um, yes, that is a real risk, isn't it? Um, it is a real risk, but uh, we 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 don't know, of course. But I agree. I mean, with I, I don't I don't think uh, Kimlicker's proposal is particularly good, precisely because he uh, he frames it within the existing sort of a paradigm of the nation state. I mean, citizenship rights to animals. What does that mean? A citizen is supposed to be part of civil society and to discuss their future and to make plans uh, and to vote. Uh, so um, it, it seemed a bit contrived. I would rather say that uh, we should begin to think of ourselves as ecological creatures, which and that the boundaries that the nation state imposes on us are now, they've always been inadequate and they are now completely very objectionable because uh, they do not fit the problem. There's a, there's a map territory problem here. You have the map, which is state-based, and then you have a territory which is global, transnational, uh, with, full, full of, with lots of connections. Uh, and ecological, so we have to shift to to that uh, gaze instead. So I'm I'm not impressed by the argument about citizenship. It's typical of a political philosopher who's devoted his life, you know, to the study of of citizenship. And and oh, he's great. I mean, in 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 his way, but uh, they're all we all have our limitations, don't we? Right. I, I see. Sorry, it, Susie was trying to write, and then I asked whether she can open the microphone. So Susie, to you, if you have yeah. a question. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation, Thomas. I wanted to ask you, how would you relate uh, Latour's work here, earthly politics? He's doing a rescaling, right, to the critical zone, this uh, thin layer of the earth. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm I'm outside walking in the forest. I'm oh, catching my oh, breath. Good to yes. you, yeah. Yes. Uh, so what about earthly politics? That would be one question. There are also other, such as what you were maybe hinting at, bioregions. Propose there's something something uh, to do with reimagining the nation or re uh, thinking the borders. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, I I would say that there are lots of feminist scholars also that are thinking already um, a little bit further about this question. So I was wondering if you could comment on those. Absolutely, I didn't get the first question quite. Could you repeat it about Latour? So Latour in his book, Earthly Politics, right? He's uh, talking about the exact problems with globalization. He's talking about the globalization plus that you were foreshadowing with this cosmopolitan ideal and globalization minus, you know, when actually this uh, one view of the world is being uh, um, recreated. Uh, and this is the elite view, right? And yep. that is not really, so I don't want to say more. So he says that there is the nation, when nation, when we are going back to the local, you know, the land and the, mm -hmm. the sort of the boundaries of the, of the nation as a, a kind of a response to this threat that we are feeling from many, um, many ways, in many ways, you know, all these crises and so on. So it's basically uh, some form of a seeking of protection. And he says that there is also this planetary, you know, that we had, this uh, technological save the world that you were also referencing. And he's proposing this idea of the fourth attractor, which is this uh, earth, right? Which would mm -hmm. be the thin layer of this critical zone that politics should be oriented towards that. So that's yes. what I'm asking if you were relating your ideas there. 
Yes, I get it. I get it. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm familiar with that, with the globalization plus and minus, uh, uh, which is, which is one useful uh, way to begin to to sort things because you're not going to be fully favorable or fully against. And see, all all of this is destructive. It's a bit like you know being against the Gulf Stream. Uh, you're not. So um, we need to make these distinctions um, quite clearly when it comes to. Uh, the way in which we can imagine a different kind of politics. Yes, I think, you know, some of those feminist scholars like Donna Haraway, Anat Singh, others in, in my sort of world, little world of, of anthropology and related uh, fields, they've been at the forefront of thinking about alternative ways of both engaging with the world and of uh, engaging with community and trying to build community. So um, there are positive tendencies, but uh, the concern is that these positive tendencies may not get very far outside of the seminar room, uh, in which case uh, it becomes a party game for intellectuals. And that is a risk. And I mean, I'm, I'm uh, you know, no better than everybody else in this. OK, uh, so I'm not saying this to uh, to criticize um, these scholars, only that we have to find ways of communicating in a persuasive way that there are different meanings of the word we, which is the most fundamental question we ask in social theory. What is the meaning of the word we? And perhaps that should be expanded in a number of cases and uh, include not only other people, but also other living entities. And that would be, that, that would be helpful. Animals included. <laughs> yes. Yes, think about like ourselves as ecological. <laughs> We're embedded. We rely on them. We depend on them and on, and on plants for our survival. Yeah. Anyway. No, yeah, sorry. Um, there is a uh, Alex Marco Pras point for myself. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, OK. Uh, I guess there should be any last question. If there is any last question, please. Um, it's time is now. Otherwise, uh, we can thank Thomas uh, for generously offering uh, uh, his ideas to the Loughborough University National Networks and to people that actually not only here from Loughborough, they are from other parts. Uh, they were able to join thanks to the technology. So thank you very much. Thank I should say much. that maybe it was not appropriate, but I was wearing the <laughs> is a Norwegian flag in there. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <Your honor>, <laughs> Well, I, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, and as you realize, this is work in progress. You know, it's Absolutely. all it's all the book yet. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm grateful for all the feedback which I'm I'm taking with me, and I've taken notes during the discussion. So thanks very much for for the invitation and for the discussion. Yeah, sorry, there was Alex. Now he had the opportunity to um... to wrap up. Okay. Basically, can I come back in briefly? But when, when, once, once we're done, I don't want to impose this on everyone. Or, or, or I can come back now if you, or, or if you have you to go. You can come back go. now. Sorry, I misread your your message. I'm, I thought you wanted to I'm talk. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. I guess I'm trying to make sense of of what you're saying again. I, so I work on anarchism among other things and pacifism and nonviolence. Just to explain where I'm coming at it. So I know what you're saying about uh, Benedict uh, Anderson uh, and where he was going. And so I suppose part of what was feeding my question is I worry that a relatively small elite, and I'm probably borderline in it in some sense in in today's political global political economy, but will continue to mobilize divisions, whether they're national or imperial, and benefit from their reinforcement through periodic acts of violence. I'm worried that the current system becomes increasingly neo-feudal. You've got some people who continue to you know, do well, and the rest of us struggle with the consequences of climate change. So mm -hmm. in that sense, I suppose I'm I'm joining you when when I think that the only identity that probably will save us is a sort of or that it will save us to imagine is a sort of human community. But that's easily cheesy and quickly dismissed. Yeah, it's the dreamer type of thing. You know, the kind of dismissals that you said you you've you faced. But so perhaps I'm wondering if it starts with trying to think of our common identity as humans struggling to survive and thrive locally and trying to really, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, not reinforce, but value kind of elevate and, and, and talk more about how we all in our local communities are facing the multiple consequences of ecological breakdown in different ways, with states anyway becoming not redundant, but 
not the primary unit of effective action on quite a few of these things. States will come in, as will other layers above them, but it, what we all share, uh, and I'm talking about the 99% plus perhaps the one, but is the question of how we survive here, me on this hill, in this city of Sheffield, you where you are in, in Oslo, wherever it is, the, and, and, and someone in Botswana or in, 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 in Madagascar. But it, these are local experiences, and that's local struggle is the one thing that possibly we do all share. So instead of trying to imagine a kind of human collective along kind of liberal demo, liberal ideals, liberal institutional ideals, whether it's cosmopolitan, whatever else, you know, it, which is something that academics can do a lot. Uh, the, it, it, maybe we need to sort of, I don't know, uh, look at what happens in the formation of yes. local communities and how that can be elevated as the common human struggle, kind of yes. bypassing these other layers. Into, I don't know if that makes more sense, but that, I suppose, yeah, I, I wanted to share to that work, too. We have to work on that. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a good summing up of some of the issues facing us. And we have to work on uh, on different scales. And uh, during the discussion, the term scarcity came up. And a scarcity, maybe a, a feeling of scarcity is often what triggers change. So what is the scarcity? What are the scarce resources among affluent people now? Um, among poor people, scarce resources, security, futures, uh, and it could be material, increasingly so. The stable weather where you can predict, you know, your, about, you know, your crops and, and, and so on. Whereas here... Maybe the main scarcity is the scarcity of autonomy and futures. You also mentioned the semi-feudal kind of tendencies where dem democracy is being hollowed out and we are becoming uh, increasingly uh, somehow hostages to a technology that no, none of us controls and which is in the hands of a very few very powerful and very rich people. So maybe that's one place to begin, to try, begin to frame what kind of scarcity we're talking about in a society where everybody has clothes and food and uh, and uh, doesn't really miss anything material. There may be other things. But anyway, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I I really have to go. So, but thanks very much, all of you. Thank you very Thank much you. again, Thomas. You. Because it's a work in progress, I'm sure maybe there will be the opportunity in the future to have you here again. Thank I you, everybody. Know. Thank you, Thomas. Every, everybody, a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye, -bye. bye. Sorry, Marco, for the general rambling. <laughs>